Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. We've been doing a series of webinars now for over a year and a quarter. Um, and we continue to do them because I have such fantastic guests with such great information that we want to present that to you and have you have the opportunity to listen to some of these amazing people that are out there in the horse world. But today, my guest is Rebecca Husted. She's coming back for her fifth webinar? Fifth or sixth. I don't know. Yeah. We've been doing a bunch of them. Yeah. Anyway, we have a playlist just for Rebecca now. So if you want to listen to all of her webinars, you can just go to her playlist on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Um, and I've done that for a variety for veterinarians and hoof talks and Friday talks so that it's a little easier for you to get through the 200 and 16 yeah. webinars that we've yeah. done. Um, I had no idea that's where we're going when I started this. Anyway, thank you, Rebecca, for joining me again. It's such a pleasure to have you. Well, I am glad to be here. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And we're going to talk about loose horses today. Great. Can oh, you by see the my way, screen? that was, was that um, uh, the equine scenting? That was one of your recommendations, right? Um, yes. Terry, Terry Nawalski. Terry Nawalski. And yes. Yep. And that was fascinating. I I really enjoyed that webinar. So I Rebecca's know. been feeding us a lot of great guests. You'll be hearing a lot more uh, from the people that she's been recommending. <laughs> well, it's really fun because I, I've met so many people over the years. You know, you go and do these things and somebody comes to your presentation and you start talking. And next thing you know, thank goodness for Facebook because I wouldn't be able to keep track of everybody otherwise. And uh, then you notice, wow, they're really doing some really cool stuff because they, they often tell you, well, I do this. And you go, okay, that's nice. But then you see their Facebook and you start realizing, hey, they really are serious about this. And then you see their publications and you start thinking, wow, maybe I ought to 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 pursue this a little bit more. And uh, so, yes. And no, it's and, great. Oh, You're making my job easy. It's, I'm glad. I love it. <laughs> I'm glad. Well, sometimes, you know, the other thing is it's some obscure person from the horse industry, but they're doing something really cool, but it's it's not mainline. So it's sort of cool to pull those people in. It's and I appreciate right. you doing that because it yep. gives a good good chance for that to happen. Super. All right. So today we're okay. going to talk about loose horses. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right. And there's so a loose we're going to talk about, huh? <laughs> there's a loose horse in the picture. Yes, this is. Okay. So you guys are going to get a lot of pictures of my horses and my friend's horses. Uh, we work a lot on loose horses. Uh, we actually do it on purpose a lot to get horses used to the concept of I'm loose so they don't lose, leave the planet. And uh, this is one of my Hanoverian mares. This is Onyx. And uh, this is one of those things, she's got a very worried expression on her face, but we've finished the ride, we're back at the trailer, and she's thinking she's done, and, and I'm asking her to go away from me and then come back to me. Uh, all the, everybody else is under containment. So we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end, how you guys can practice some of these kind of things. And I know there's some people who are like, my horse is worth too much. And I go, well, it's worth too much until your horse gets loose, and then you're going to wish you would have done some of, the, some of the groundwork. So we'll talk about that by the end. So... Really, one of the things I want to do is think how we think about this problem. So I'm going to go ahead and admit there's some graphic photos in this presentation. Um, I'm sorry about that, but I think it's important. There's some dangerous things that happen with loose horses. I, I took most of the, the gore and blood out of it, but I do want you guys to understand that it's um, frustrating. And then you're going to be asked to take responsibility for your actions. Uh, if your horse gets loose for any reason and it goes out in the road and somebody else hits it, you are responsible for that person. People get killed by hitting other people's horses. They get uh, severely injured, as well as your animal being uh, just hurt. So uh, when we talk about responsibility, we're talking about insurance. We're thinking about secondary fencing. We're talking about all these things that can keep your horses where they're supposed to be at all times so that you don't have to worry about those things. Uh, this presentation is, is dedicated to three different horses, uh, Raquel o Okenfels, recently found her horse. Uh, it had been missing for four years. They found it with its halter and bridle still on and its saddle. And uh, she had gotten loose and they never found it in some hunters. Found the spring. And that's, that's awful. Uh, I remember a horse that got loose many, many years ago when I, when I used to have a little publication and uh, there was a nationwide hunt for that. That's back before there was Google and all these things that we have today to be able to get the word out. And literally, we published things in newspapers and things asking, uh, trying to find this horse. Cute little Toby Ann O'Mare. Um, she was in a 40-acre pasture. Months later, uh, the lady's husband noticed that there was coyotes coming out of this hole in the pasture, and she had fallen down in that hole. She'd been 250 feet from her barn that whole time. They never found her while she was alive. And um, I have never forgotten about Bunny. 
um, and then Ava. So Ava was a horse that this young lady who loved her horse, she actually lost her other horses. Um, one of them had to be shot after a wildfire. They got there just as the wildfire was literally coming over the hill, and Ava is the only one that survived. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about loose horses, but why they're loose is another problem. And, um, you know, this lady uh, literally risked her life to try to save her horses, and she still had to let them go because the firestorm was swirling all around her. She had to take care of her own life, and sadly, um, she lost her horses with it. So the next thing I want to talk about is it happens to everybody. That is my lovely husband, and that is my five horses. And if you're a horse person and you're doing anything with your horses, you're eventually going to have your horses get away. It just, it's going to happen. Wendy, has it ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> People don't like to talk about it because they sometimes think, oh, well, I must be a bad horse person. No, if you're a horse person and you're doing things with horses, they have their own opinions. They're not motorcycles. So they do their own thing. So that's my truck parked out in front of my place after I left the gate. Wendy, I think... The gate only has to be open for 0.01 seconds. <laughs> and and they, go, they, they look down there and they go, oh, the gate's open. I mean, literally, they turned, they looked, and all five of them went hauling butt down the driveway, came out here. Fortunately, they stopped because there was some fresh grass that nobody else's lips have touched. Um, but this is a two-lane highway, but it's a big rock truck thing. About 25% of the, the things that go through there, 4,000 cars a day. And of course, my heart was in my throat. And we jumped in the truck. I grabbed a, a bucket of grain. He grabbed a rope. We ran down there, and we were fortunately able to catch him. And what we did was we caught one and started walking back to the to the house, and the rest of them followed. So it happens to everybody. I'm, I'm telling you, you don't have to feel guilty about it. And and because of that, I want you guys to admit the sin that it can happen, and then do something proactive um, when you see why you want to do that. So the next thing is. How do we define a loose horse? So when Wendy asked me to do this thing, I was like, okay, loose horse, but then how do you define that? Is that everybody's been at a show or a rodeo or whatever, and you know, there's the loose horses running around. You know, people are like, oh my God, loose horse, and, and people panic and, and do all the things that they do. But what else is there? You know, is your horse running down the road after a barn fire? Is it loose at the trailhead um, with a halter attached? I mean, that makes things a lot easier if that happens. Um, is it loose in your driveway, like my place, and there's no gate at the road? I actually do have a gate, but if the gate's not open, if, if the gate's open, it's no gate. Okay. Um, is it fully tacked and loose 25 miles from a road in the mountains? Now, that's what Lori and uh, Terry Nowicki were talking about the other day. You know, how do you track down a horse that's literally could be anywhere out in the mountains? Um, and, and I'm not going to really talk about those kind of things. That's not my bailiwick. Is it a BLM a uh, thing or a donkey that's jumped out of his pen that happens so often that's why blm requires you to have a six foot fence and all this other stuff because they know they're going to leave yeah um is it your next door neighbor's two-year-old stallion <laughs> that came over to meet your girls you know and then the next question is is it a loose horse or is it 10 loose horses or is it 50 loose horses you know uh that's what often happens at some of these shows one get horse gets loose and then they get everything else excited. Now you got two or three loose horses and it can really be a nightmare from there. Um, or is it, you know, running loose after a wildfire? Um, I will also tell you more and more stories that I've had with loose horses. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. See, that's the thing. Loose horse is poorly defined for most people. They're thinking of different things. And it all depends on if you're a trail rider, if you go to shows, if you uh, have, you know, manage a barn, every one of you are going to think a little different about what a loose horse is. But I'm going to tell you that there's lots of different definitions of a loose horse. And so that's why I'm going to talk about a lot of different things today. Um, I will tell you, I'm not really going to talk about the loose horse where you have no idea what, where to start looking. Um, you're actually, uh, Wendy's going to have another person come on, Debbie Metcalf, at some point to talk about those kind of things. What I'm talking about is uh, the horse that gets loose. Now, this one's funny. You know, this is one of my girlfriends that I had just met back in February. And, and she, we'd been out trail riding, Wendy, and, and she'd said something about, wow, so many places a horse can get stuck because I was telling her these stories. And usually I tell people, once you find out what I do, it takes two weeks. Well, for her, five days later, she calls me and she says, hey, what you doing? <laughs> and I said, uh, not much. What are you doing? She goes, I think I have an emergency. And I was like, 
what? She's got, my pony is stuck in a gate. How is your pony stuck in a gate? Send me a picture. So she sends me a picture. I jump in the truck, run over there. Her brother shows up and we were able to actually lift the gate off the hinges because the, the lock on here was pretty, pretty significant. We weren't going to be able to cut that. So we just lifted the gate off the hinges and we let Frankie the pony left. And this is, Wendy, this is the walk of shame. You know, this is, <laughs> the other pony's like, I can't believe you. But anyway, uh, fortunately, nobody was hurt. It, the in, animals weren't hurt. Uh, she was smart enough to bring the other horses to keep this one calm while she was waiting on some help. She had a cell phone. She had a plan. Um, so, you know, I, know I, I joke around. I know about I'm it, laughing, but it, it, because it's funny because it's a happy ending, right? <laughs> it's a happy ending. And there's so many ways that this could have been so much wrong because it was actually going towards the road. So could have been really wrong. So. You know, sometimes you get these calls. Uh, I work a lot with animal control on equine cruelty investigations classes and stuff too. And, you know, we went and looked for this donkey and this is the only thing we found on this donkey for two days. And he's a BLM donkey. So what I did was I called around to everybody in the area that might have horses um, that I knew. And then they had them call and say, hey, if you see a donkey, let it into your, into your barn area and get it in a fence. And then we'll, and call me and we will come get it. Sure enough, that night, he shows up in this one lady's place. She opens the gate, gives him a little food. Of course, he came for food, shut the gate, called me, and I said, I'll be there first thing in the morning. So first thing in the morning, we go out there. Uh, he had made friends with this horse by that time, um, overnight. And uh, we just made a little bit of, used some panels and sort of drove him onto my horse trailer. There he is walking um, towards my horse trailer. There's panels and those kind of things. He's following the other horse. And he literally walked onto that trailer because that herd instinct to be with another horse or, I mean, this is a donkey. It's not even a horse. You know, it's an equine. Oh, <laughs> but overnight, he had made enough of a friend. He was like, any friend's better than no friend. You might not be exactly like me, but you're better than nothing. He walked right on that trailer. We were able to get him on the trailer, swirl the horse out of the way with some distraction with food, shut the door, and then take him back to where he was supposed to be. And fortunately, he's stayed there since then. But, okay. you know, literally, he had been dumped off the trailer from a BLM uh, sale like two days before. And it, it doesn't take long. They're just like, I'm leaving, you know, very, very strong. So what is probably your first thing to do these days with the advent of social media and those kind of things if your animal gets loose? and it's not inside containment. It goes down the driveway, it hits the road, um, whatever. Uh, obviously you need to call 911. That is literally the first thing that you need to do. And the reason you want to do that is because you need some help. If he actually is going towards the road, they're going to be trying to stop traffic, those kind of things. Um, if you are big into social media, social media can be very helpful. I will tell you that if you say, Frankie's loose, on social media that does no one any good except the three people that know you and Frankie. So if you say uh, the horse is loose going north on 49, uh, this is in Jones County, Georgia, uh, you know, give a little bit more details about where and, and, and what the horse looks like, a description, those kind of things, that will help everybody a lot. Um, but if you, you know, these are just some random things that I pulled off the internet of, I put in loose horse into Facebook and it's amazing how many loose horses are out there. And I love this one. You know, this gal's driving down the interstate and those big digital signs. I have not seen this one yet, but I love it. Watch out for loose horses next six miles. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? But on the other hand, that does prepare people for the fact that there could be a loose horse on the interstate in front of you. Now, yeah. how horses get out on the interstate? Um, either the fence is busted or they got out of a trailer that was on the side of the road or whatever. There's, you know, way too many examples of when cattle and horses end up up on the road. So uh, that is your first thing. Call 911 no matter what. Uh, people get embarrassed and they don't want to do those kind of things. But I'm telling you, it is better to have a police officer show up and help you with the situation, give you some more people, those kind of things. Uh, the problem, for, of course, and I'm not, offend, don't, I'm not trying to offend anyone if you're a police officer. But most police officers don't have a lot of expertise with horses. So, but they can handle people and they can handle traffic and, and they can bring other resources. Because sometimes what happens, Wendy, is the horse gets loose and he runs down the road, then he takes a right, ends up in front of somebody's front yard and ends up trapped in wire, trapped in who knows, whatever, falls into the mud hole, whatever. Um, so at that point, it gives you some options. At least you've got somebody rolling to try to help you. And then, of course, your your horse friends would be useful. So 
this is the, the one to sort of promote you guys. Um, I don't really talk about stolen horses, horses that have been lost for more than four hours. Usually that means somebody's either taken it or you need to get a search and rescue going. Um, hopefully this will be a future webinar with Wendy. I've hooked the two of them yeah, up. Yep, we're working on it. Debbie's awesome. So um, this is just the latest one. This is Cody that's uh, missing right now that's uh, near Sorrento, Florida. So lots of reasons why horses uh, get stolen or, or whatever. But anyway, so if you're going to do this and you're going to call 911 or you're going to put this out on social media, this is my one to say, please give the correct information because that does not look like a horse to me. <laughs> that looks like a mule to me. So the simple things, you know, the correct information, what location, and I mean town, county, state, what road it's on, uh, a good description. You know, is it a pony? A lot of non-horse people don't know what a pony is. They don't realize that there's large ponies. So, you know, you could estimate not in hands so much. Maybe he's three feet tall or he's six feet tall. Uh, he's brown. Remember, non-horse people, they don't know what bay is. It's brown to them, okay? With a black mane and tail, they might understand that. Uh, breed might be important to other people, um, those kind of things. And then, of course, who to contact. Uh, that, it's amazing to me how many people put these things out on social media and they don't, don't give a phone number or an email um, and, and they expect people to PM them. But if you've ever used Facebook, you know that PMs um, from somebody that's not in your network doesn't come to you as easily as it does if it's a friend. So. Right. Think about those kind of things. It's really important. This mule, uh, he looks like he's very interested. I bet you if that person actually stopped their vehicle and rattled the uh, gum container that they have in their vehicle, I bet you he'd come right to him. You could catch him. He, he looks like he's stressed and worried. Look at his ears. Look at his expression. He's trying to figure out what's going on. Where is this? This is uh, near Walmart. That's my point. You know, where? I, I have no idea. It could be anywhere USA, right? Yeah, it's like near so, Burger King. and it's like... That's right. So the thing is, Wendy, why do they end up in the middle of the road? Why do they stay in the middle of the road? Does anybody know? Uh, why do squirrels go in the road? Why that's do right. bunnies go in the road? Yesterday, I avoided a bear, multiple deer, bunnies, groundhogs. <laughs> it's like they're all I will tell you for horses, there's actually a reason. And oh. the reason is that the road is the area that has the least going on emotionally. So if you think about it, when you, if you, I, I didn't, I have one video in here, but uh, if you actually do a little Googling uh, or YouTubing and you look at horse running down the road and look at any of the random videos and you'll see, they literally stay in the middle of the road. The reason is because, oh my God, there's a, there's a mailbox. Oh my God, there's, there's, you know, oh. all the scary things are on the side the lizards jumping out of whatever, the whatevers. So that's why they stay in the middle of the road. And then of course, sadly, people that don't know any better than the animals to try to quote, catch them, they chase them with vehicles. And they're either chasing them or as we'll see hopefully in the video, if I can get it to run, um, they're actually going together with the, the, the video, the vehicles many times. They're like, oh, well, you look like me, we'll go along with you. Um, and that can be really dangerous to do. Uh, there's a Years ago in the Tour de France, there was actually a horse that jumped the fence. He's a beautiful jumper and he joined the leaders in the Tour de France. Oh, wow. If you look it up, it's still on YouTube and you'll see him jump and he just joins and he's like, yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, I'm hot stuff. Let's go. And he is booking it with the leaders in the Tour de France. And they're all like, what's going on? And eventually they managed to get him to go one way and, and they went the other. But he literally was raiding them. He wasn't outrunning them. He was like, I'm with y'all. I have found my people. I'm ready. <laughs> anyway, so that has a lot to do with it. There is actually a behavioral reason why they do those kind of things. And, and sadly, they don't understand. That... The rabbit and the squirrels and the deer and the bears that all like to sit in the middle of the road and be hazardous. Yep. I don't know. So loose horses that show up on your property, uh, it, this happens to be one that was called in by animal control. This, this person was freaking out because there's a horse in their yard. And so I went over to try to help them get it. Of course, it's a stallion because that's what always has happens in redneck Georgia. And of course, he's never been handled. And of course, you can't get a rope on him. And of course, you can't put a halter on him. So we used portable fencing. So this is something we use in large animal rescue, but we have found it very useful for you know, you can notice that we closed the gate, so we've got the fence, but that's not really a good fence behind us. And then we're using the portable fencing to keep him in a contained area. And then we called for some, some vehicles to bring trailers so that we could try to get him in. 
Now, I will tell you, Wendy, that if you are trying to load something that's never been in a two horse trailer, they brought this trailer and I was like, uh, that's not going to work real well. So you see, we're using portable fencing and cattle panels and all those kind of things. And we got him this far and he said, no. So we said, all right, heck with it. We put him in a big trailer and put a bucket in there and he went right in. So never forget about those kind of things when you're trying to catch uh, loose horses. The bigger the trailer you got, don't bring a two horse. A two horse is better than nothing, but a big trailer is a stock trailer. That kind of trailer is always better. And if you're brave enough, you can have a, a, some bait. I usually use torque for bait. B torque doesn't like being bait, but that's all right. Oh, that's torque we meaning your horse. Torque, torque being my horse. Yeah, I put him in that in that first stall usually and yep. have him be bait and the other horse will jump on. We actually picked up a horse with animal control last week and used him for bait and the horse jumped right on. He was like, I am sick and tired of being out here in the road doing nothing. And there's a horse on that trailer. Plus there's hay and I'm getting on that trailer and we shut the gate. <laughs> okay. Uh, for you, um, all you guys that are, that are paying attention, we really want to think about who are my friends that actually know something about catching horses? Okay. And, and you know what I mean, Wendy, there's plenty of people who have horses, but they don't really have horsemanship skills. And they, they probably would be the person that would be running out there and waving their hands and doing those kind of things. And then there's the other people that do understand a little bit about horsemanship. This girlfriend in, in the yellow, she's one of my girlfriends and, and I know she knows something about horses. And so of course she showed up, she brought some halters, she brought a bucket, we were able to catch one. Once you can catch one, usually you can catch two. Of course, the foal was running loose. And then there was a third one that finally noodled around and we managed to catch him. Um, but having that network of people who you know actually know something about horses and are close enough to you that they can actually make a difference. Somebody that's an awesome horseman but lives two hours away doesn't do you much good. So who lives down the street that actually is going to be useful for these kind of things? And then thinking through the process of, you know, obviously we'd called 911 immediately. Then we caught the horses. And, you know, what is the process here? I love it when people show up in flip-flops. Um, don't show up in flip-flops. Anyway, uh, and then what we did was we held on to the ones that we could catch until the other ones noodled around a little bit. And they finally, they, they might go 25 yards, but they're not going to go very far. And then we were able to catch them as they start to calm down. Because as you know, Wendy, when everybody's excited and they're running around, and then they're like, wait, nobody else is running. And then they're like, fine, and they'll come to you. So that's what worked for this. I do want to remind everybody that if it actually gets out on the road or if it uh, gets hurt by somebody else or hit by a car or hurts somebody else's property, um, you're going to get a ticket. This lady actually got a ticket. Her horse had been noodling through other people's yards and, uh, you know, eating everything in sight and, and destroying some of their property. So she actually got a ticket for this. This was not her first time doing this. So oh. never forget that, you know, you are responsible for whatever your horse does. And um, I, I know that's sort of a thing these days. A lot of people don't want to take responsibility for their actions. Am I allowed to say that on your webinar, Wendy? But uh, I, I encourage course, people I to so. take responsibility. <laughs> your horse is your problem. So you may end up getting a ticket for it if, if, uh, if it gets somebody else impacted. So some of the kinds of things where I just want to show you guys, I hope you're never in this situation, but sometimes horses get loose on highways and it's big highways. Um, it, it, it's impossible to practice doing something like this, but this is where your horsemanship skills come in. Most people lead their horse from, I'm not being mean. I, I watch it all the time. I go to, I go to hundreds of, of barns over the years and I watch people lead their horse from their stall to the wash rack, put the saddle on to the arena, back to the wash rack and back to the stall, maybe to the turnout paddock. But some of them are like, Ooh, I'm scared to turn him out in the paddock because he might kick me. So, they never lead a horse under scary conditions. It's only under controlled conditions. So you have to practice. You have to do things like lead your horse away from the barn. You have to lead your horse away from other horses. You have to practice. Uh, I'm not advocating going out on a four-lane highway and practicing that, but I am saying that if your horse is potentially scared of uh, railroad tracks, maybe you rent for a month, you put your horse out on a, a pasture that has railroad tracks and they'll get used to the trains. Whatever it takes to get your horse used to being under these kinds of scary conditions. And that's really out of the scope of this discussion because that's all into horsemanship stuff. But I encourage you, if you don't know how to do those things, find somebody that understands horsemanship that can teach you because it is a skill that you can learn. And you will find one of these days 
um, it may be very useful too. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can get this video to run and let's see if we can get it. I'm gonna go out to the 224 mark. I want you guys to watch what I'm talking about. Can you see it, Wendy? Yeah, it's just starting to play now. Okay, so there's a horse trotting in front of this guy. He's, oh. got, the, he's got the owner on the back. And notice the horse is not leaving. He's like, yay, my, my, my village has showed up. It's a little broken up. This looks like Holland. <laughs> oh, okay. There, we're just the horse just came back into view alongside of the. Okay. There you go. And the the rider is on the back, and she reaches out, grabs the rein, and brings the horse to a stop. It just says in Holland. <laughs> she just told. She just said. She said, I should kiss you. <laughs> so the point of that video is what I was saying. Um, animals that are four-legged animals, they will, when they're terrified, they will run with anything that looks like them, even if it's as crazy as being on a scooter. So uh, vehicles, bicycles, those kind of things, when they're scared, they'll sort of join up with them and, and flow along. And in the end, they were able to get in front of the horse, uh, and slow down just enough that she could reach out and grab his rein and stop. And she, he had been running loose for two and a half minutes. And in that video, I think she passed 17 vehicles and her horse didn't get hit. So thank goodness. But this is what usually happens. Um, other drivers aren't expecting horses in the road. They're noodling around doing all the things that other drivers do. And this is why you really got to come up with a plan for how you're going to handle horses on roads. Now, Griffin Road in Florida um, is very active highway, and there's a lot of riding that happens down there. I've, got, I've done some, some trainings down there, and I, even I raise my eyebrows a little bit to say, wow, that's really a dangerous place to be learning to ride your horse. But um, this one sadly paid the price. So please um, be very careful if you're, if you're uh, managing a facility or or, or a show or any other thing where you might have loose horses and have a plan uh, for what you're going to do because it gets people killed too. I mean, it's bad enough the horses get killed, but uh, this is just three that I pulled up. This happens to be the same county, the same road with two different incidents in the same year wow. um, where people got killed hitting a horse. Um, I don't know if those were wild horses or if they were uh, loose horses, but the point being in at five o'clock in the morning, you don't see it. And when you hit it that speed, it's probably going to kill you. It's probably going to kill the horse too. So that's why we have to take responsibility for what we do with our horses and make sure that they don't get they don't get out if at all possible. So let's change gears a little bit and talk about uh, loose horses under disaster situations, which is what I normally talk about is uh, technical large animal emergency rescues and disasters and those kind of things. Um, I will tell you that best practice for any disaster is to get them out early if at all possible. And, under most uh, of those kinds of disasters. Sadly, some of these wildfires that we've been having lately, Wendy, there really isn't time. I mean, like that horse Ava, the, the lady described that the flames were coming over the ridge as she arrived to try to get her horses out and there's not enough time to evacuate. So um, we talked about wildfire a little bit in a previous presentation. There are some things, the best practice is to evacuate early, but sometimes you're in that situation where you can't really do anything. So. Uh, sadly, when that happens, this is what happens. So animals are swirling around. They end up in places that they normally would never be. Uh, I, I unfortunately go to lots of barns where they have traps around the barn as though horses are never going to get loose. And I go, why do you have that piece of heavy equipment sitting there? You know, it's, it's got a chain on it. Uh, a, a loose horse running in the dark could just run over that and to get their leg trapped in it or they've got an open pit or something that's uh, or a composting pit that's that's not protected and uh, I will tell you that I worry about those kind of things when animals get loose so you know your horse gets loose because you let him go because there's wildfire coming where is he going to end up he's going to end up in the road and sadly the people that get impacted is going to be the horse but also other people and the firefighters that are showing up to try to help with the wildfire are potentially going to be impacted as well. Um, when we talk about wildfire, the problem is it moves really fast. This is a picture of the easy fire when it first started. 
And I mean, when the winds are moving at 74 miles an hour, that pushes the fire at 74 miles an hour. It's uh, terrifying. And of course, the cinders and those kind of things that move forward cause these kinds of situations to happen. And this is why I tell people that you really need that horsemanship skills of being able to lead and catch your horse, because uh, this is terrifying. Uh, lots of different horses, lots of crazy things going on. This lady is literally taking her mare and her foal, and she didn't have time to link to the trailer, so she's trotting her horse down the road. And I, I hate to tell you that, but that would be me. I wouldn't be able to trot for very long, just saying, I'd be walking. <laughs> but that is where we're gonna be. And, and if you think about how you can prepare to be able to um, be able to deal with those kind of things, that's a very good horse that's leading down a road in this situation with all those cars and people. And uh, looks like she's, she's, she set herself up for success. So um, the other reason I tell people that you should try not to let your horses go is because of the other people that are going to try to help you. And this is, you know, there's 17 people trying to help load this horse in a trailer on the pavement. And I, I can't believe they didn't get hurt. So um, this picture alone should make you res feel responsible for making sure that your horse never gets uh, loose in those kinds of situations. Plan ahead, best practice. So that really comes down to having a plan because, you know, when you're out there, you know, there you are with your horse uh, looking at the evacuation route and going, hey, I don't have a plan. Uh, I want you to have a plan. The thing is, your community has a plan. And many communities don't have common enough disasters, so they don't worry about it. If you live in the middle of Kansas, you don't probably worry about these kind of things. But if you're in places that get affected by wildfire or hurricanes, those kind of things, that's where people need to take a little bit more serious look at how can I come up with a plan ahead of time. And part of your plan needs to be, how do I handle loose horses? Um, whether it's from the disaster itself or if a barn has a, a, a fence come down, those kind of things. Uh, we've talked about wildfire considerations in the past. I'm just gonna leave this up for a second so that people understand there are plans. You can do things to evacuate or shelter in place. Um, and that's a whole nother presentation that we've already done um, before. But this is how do you have a plan? And these are communities that have people to try to catch these loose horses under disaster conditions um, where they bring trailers and they have people who know how to handle horses and they can catch loose horses. Um, and that's just admirable to me. And it tends to be in places like California where they have lots of wildfires. But having a plan, you know, maybe Maybe your whole community doesn't have a plan, but your little area where, you know, you, six or seven barns down a road, you guys should be friends. You should know how to help each other under these kinds of things um, instead of wait until it actually happens. So don't let them go. That is not a plan. That's just not a plan. Please don't let them go. Um, there's no horse in the world that's used to going down a, a four lane highway or even a two lane highway with vehicles and all the scary things. And under these kinds of cons considerations, it's just not a plan. So please don't let them go, if at all possible. If you gotta let them go, because I just said don't do it, right? But we all know it does happen. Um, and under, this is obviously a, a training scenario where the firefighter is actually in their full gear and they're learning how to get a horse out of a stall and lead it out of a barn, which is extremely difficult to do and very dangerous to do. And you're probably never gonna do it. Uh, Wendy and I did a presentation about barn fires before, but this is how you're going to do it is if you're a firefighter and you've got on your full gear and you've got on your, your gloves and all those kind of things in a barn fire situation, you don't have time to be doing the little thingy on the halter and putting the little thingy through the hole. You got to be able to put a rope around a neck and walk. So teach your horses to be led that way. There is so many horses that don't know how to lead just by putting a rope around their neck. It's a fundamental skill for your horse. It's a fundamental skill for horsemen. You should know how to put a rope around the neck, get it up close behind the ears and, and the chin and walk. And many times the horse will walk with you. So set them up for success and teach them how to do that. Um, again, you know, under real conditions, it's really hard to do. Um, and the run out plans and those kind of things that we talk about is a different presentation for barn fires but this is proof that it can be done. It just requires a plan. So how are we gonna set ourselves up for success? This is hauling ass, Wendy. Not real hard, just get a feed bucket and walk. And the other asses will come along, you know? This is my girlfriend uh, up in South Carolina and that's Oscar that she's leading. And 
you know, the, the donkeys get out. She catches one and with a bucket and leads him home. And everybody else is like, oh, that looks like a good idea. I'll follow along. And cattle are the same way. But I will, you know, this is using their herding instinct and all their innate behaviors and all those things here invented. But I will tell you that if there's a bunch of horses and you get the bucket, I don't know, Wendy, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be a real questionable situation. Uh, at least possibly you can get the alpha to come to you and, and get a rope around their neck. So uh, still, it's very difficult. Uh, I have seen people walk out into pasture with one bucket and 40 horses and I go, what are you thinking? I mean, I only would go out there with a bucket and a whip and I'd still probably get killed. So be very careful if you're talking multiple horses. Um, if you take it out, a, a bucket out there, there's ways to do it. Um, maybe get on the other side of the fence. Fundamental things for loose horses is no matter what the situation, don't chase it. Uh, if it, uh, her friend is over to the left in this picture and she's on the other right, this is actually Ariel. This is one of my horses and she's posing for me. This is a one, one way in road. So there's minimal traffic on it. We set it up for success, but we cut her loose and let her run out there and the point is, if I chase her here, I'm chasing her away from her friend. So walk way around behind her and get on the other side. Maybe she'll turn around and go back to her friend. Maybe you can block her off in some way, but do not chase her away from her friend. You've already got the friend attraction going for you, so use that to your benefit. Do not chase. So that's what we did. We got on the back side of her, and then she said, tail in the air, see ya and ran down the driveway to be with her friend, and now she's grazing. At this point, we've got a little bit better control. Uh, this is where the picture that really shows you, I like the concept of secondary fencing. Even if that secondary fencing isn't used most of the time, if you've got a gate that you could close, I don't care if you never close it, but if you've got a gate that you can just pull across there, um, secondary fencing is a way to keep loose horses from getting to the road. And uh, for large farms, they usually have those. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of having something down there that you can use to block horses from going to the road. So this is a call that came in through animal control. There was actually a foal. Uh, he had been weaned and put out in the pasture with a bunch of other strange horses. I don't know why people do those kind of things. But anyway, they dumped him out, freshly weaned, into a pasture with strange horses, and he left, and I would too, because the other horses were chasing him around. So then they couldn't find him for like two days. So we finally got a call from animal control. I took my horses, a girlfriend and I, we just went riding and looked for tracks. And after about, I don't know, a mile or so, we found some tracks. And we found, those tracks and we found them uh, going back into a place. And the, the baby had found a place with good grass and was back there. He was perfectly healthy and happy. He had a halter on, which I was absolutely terrified with because I thought he might get trapped. But as soon as he saw our horses, he was like, yay, horses! And he just followed us. So now we're going out to the dirt road. We're going out to an area that's sort of contained. We brought in some fencing. We were able to contain him and then get him on the trailer um, using the Judas horses. So Judas horses work beautifully. Uh, we use them for wild horses. We use them for domesticated horses uh, to be able to, to get that one scared horse to follow us um, to a safer position where you can deal with him. Don't try to put your hands on him if you don't have that. This is a, a, a really good feel-good story. This is a girlfriend of mine. She was able to, this horse had been out in this one big place near an interstate um, for like five years. And Kim Delaney came along. She found out about this horse. She went out there and tried to make friends with her over a couple of months. Finally went out there with one of her horses as a Judas. And this horse was like, yay, a horse! And they were able to walk her onto the trailer. Uh, sadly, she had some pretty severe problems, and eventually they ended up putting her down. But at least she wasn't shot by poachers or any of those kind of things. And, uh, and, and she died with uh, a lot of love. So that's, that's always a better situation. So there you go. Where's the term Judas horse come from? I, I'm not familiar with it. You know, I don't know. Um, never thought about it. Uh, I know Judas is in the Bible, uh, but I don't know the whole story on Judas. So I now you give me something to look up. It's just one of those things I've always used. But uh, a bait horse—that's that's the that's the thing that we're really talking about. So I got to tell you guys about this one because this is an absolutely awesome situation, and I ended up meeting these folks um, after the the situation happened. Somebody had mowed the pasture and left the gate open, 
uh, to that that went to the back pasture. So nobody could tell because it's on the absolute back part of the pasture. And uh, they went home. Everybody fed the horses and all this kind of things. Next morning, they feed. They let the horses out onto the paddock. And it's a big paddock. It's probably 25 acres. The horses run out in the paddock and do their noodling thing. And then they go, yay, the gate's open. And they all leave. And it's like 24 horses. And they go down the four-lane highway. And they're getting ready to go towards the interstate. And uh, you'll notice this guy's got on his jammies and his flip-flops. And the reason is because it went out on Facebook, this viral video of horses running down this interstate together with the cars. And uh, his kid's like, you know, he said he's pouring the cereal. And his kid goes, Dad, our horses are on the interstate. What? <laughs> so they jump in the truck and they run out there. So there's kids and parents and, and everybody that can possibly be there. And they were very successful. They actually got these horses. Nobody got hurt. No horses got hurt. Uh, and they, you notice they're leading those horses back up the interstate as a group, which is the great way to do it. And, and I was just like, um, um, I can't believe you guys managed to do this. And they said it was, they said that it was absolutely terrifying. So, uh, after that, I went out there and did some work with them and they have really tightened up the plan for what they're going to do. Uh, if this ever happens again, cause it, you know, you're, you're close to Atlanta and yeah, I'll look at the road sign Augusta making it. Fun. I know it's right there, you know, and I love it when I see these things on the internet and then I get a phone call like three days later and they're like, hey, uh... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this is an example of of what they use now. So you, you call 911, whoever finds out about it first, the horses are out, you call 911, engage those folks for safety and that kind of thing. Uh, somebody hitches a truck to the trailer uh, just in case a horse get hurt. Um, they would have the capability to load the horse in the trailer and be able to take it to definitive veterinary care. Obviously, if the horse is severely injured, you may have to call the veterinarian to the scene. Um, they started calling personnel. So they have a list of all the people that are at their, that, at their facility that they can call, including employees, uh, including parents, all those kind of folks. Uh, they have some portable fencing. Um, it's only about 150 feet of fencing, but they have the portable fencing. So maybe they could fence off a little area you know, what's really funny is they said most of these horses, once they caught, caught a couple of them, the rest of them just started grazing and uh, they were pretty easy to catch. You can, you know, thank goodness that somebody picks up a bucket with feed so that you can try to get that. Uh, you share the plan. You, you, you have to share the plan. And, and when do you know any of these big barns, you have a rotation of people. People leave, people die, people whatever. And you, everybody needs to know the plan. So when new people come, they need to be educated on what's the plan. How do you work with the plan? And chasing the animals and waving your hands is not the, the plan. How do you communicate with your neighbor? And how can you get the word out to many people as possible? Um, and then they also started working on, hey, you know, there's some of these horses that live at the facility. They never really go anywhere, but they probably need to be practiced on training to load because on the side of the road, if we couldn't lead them back, we might have to load them um, you know, if there's two horses, I wouldn't have let them back down the interstate. I would have put them on a trailer and brought them back. That would have been a safer way to do it. But with 24, what are you going to do? Wait there for 12 trips? I mean, that's dumb. So to me, they did the right thing here. And that all depends on your situation. Where are you? How many horses are we talking about? What 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 is the long-term program? Well, and here? this is where calling 911 and having to, uh, the police come and control mm -hmm. traffic to make that safer for everybody is like really important. If you look that one up on, on YouTube, if you get a chance, uh, Horses Loose on the Interstate in Atlanta, you'll find it. And it's a terrifying video because there's cars and they're just coming along with horses. And this one person that took the video is actually driving and taking video at the same time. And those horses are all over the road and nobody got hit. I, I do not understand that one. Other than everybody's used to traffic stopping in Atlanta. So they're like, ah, well, I guess we got to stop. <laughs> I don't know. So so, so uh, we do so, have an answer to the Judas question. Um, oh, good. Somebody look, looked it up. Diane says, uh, Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Judas horse is a horse that betrays the horse being caught. Um, That's why they call it. Goat Yay. To lead sheep or cattle to slaughter calmly. That's cool. Yeah. Very, very, yes. So they even <laughs> use Judas animals um, when they're catching uh, some of the wild, wild animals in Africa. Sometimes they'll use a Judas animal. Because you can use a Judas horse, um, antelope will follow. 
I mean, once something starts running, everything else is like, yeah, we're going to run because there must be a lion over there. And they sometimes use Judas animals for that. So pretty cool. So what are some other things that we can do as horsemen and women? Uh, what are some things that we can do to uh, set our horses up for success? If your horse gets loose with a rope dragon or a bridle dragon and doesn't know what to do if he steps on it, he will kill himself. He will break his jaw. He will flip over backwards. He will do all the dumb things that horses can do if they panic. So I always tell people, to me, it's a fundamental skill that a horse should know what happens if he steps on a rope. You can notice that Onyx uh, has done this enough times that she's actually she's actually doing a two track and she's dragging the rope with her and she can trot and canter like that and she never touches the rope. So uh, that's a, a fundamental skill. And this is a girlfriend of mine. She's got a little two year old and, and we were doing a photo shoot with him. She's been working really hard with this little filly and uh, taught her to step on the rope. And here she is stepping on the rope and she's yielding to the rope. I don't know how I managed to catch that picture, but that's exactly what's happening here. Also, a really so. good way to catch your horse if they get with a halter, they're going to step on the rope and then you can catch them. <laughs> that's right. But, you know, if he panics because he doesn't know what to do with the rope, or if he panics because the rope is dragging behind him and he thinks it's a snake uh, scaring him, that, then that's different. It, and, it, and this really does, is a training thing to me. Yeah. Uh, the next step for training is once you are able to catch him, and I don't care, this could be a golf cart. This just happens to me, me, me leading Ariel last week for the photo shoot, but um, it could be a golf cart. It could be an ATV. It could be whatever, but they should know how to walk calmly next to a vehicle because sometimes they go a lot longer than you want to walk and in more dangerous situations that you want to block or protect the animal. So uh, teach them to lead from a vehicle. You don't have to be going 40 miles an hour. You're just crawling, but that gives you a safe way to block traffic while you're trying to get the horse home. Are you backing up? Yes, I'm backing up because I didn't have a third person. I had a photographer, I had me, and I didn't have a third person. I would much prefer that it was the passenger that's leading the, ve the, the vehicle. So I had to back up instead of, of driving. Okay, just check. Yeah, I know. I know. So okay. then this is forward the, and back, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, they really don't care because they're they, they literally um, they go along with the speed of the vehicle. And it's amazing. You can walk, trot and canter with a horse next to a vehicle. Uh, I've seen people do it and it's pretty amazing. They just sort of they're like, oh, well, you must be one of me and I'll go along with you uh, until they try to cut in front of you. That's the dangerous part because that's when they get hurt and you get hurt. So this is the, and I know this is a whole nother level um, that some people may not be uh, comfortable with, but to me, uh, I don't want the horse to leave the planet when he's loose. So set it up for success. He's going to dinner anyway. So let him go and, and go to his bucket um, under situations where he normally wouldn't do that. Do it at a local trail that he's used to. Uh, you're coming back from a seven mile ride and he's dripping sweat. So he's like, dude, I ain't running off. I mean, I wouldn't do this in the beginning. I would do it at the very end of the ride. Uh, inside a fenced area. Some of the places that we do trail riding have secondary fencing. So you close the gate, set it up for success, have a, a bucket and, and catch your, practice catching your horse. This is something that you should be able to do. And of course, again, the horsemanship skill would be call your horse and your horse comes to you. So, you, but you got to work on that. And, and you start when it's five feet away from you, not 5,000 feet away from you. And, and you work on it just a little bit at a time and nothing will make you feel better about yourself and having a relationship with your horse than being able to call them and get them come to you, even if they know they're going to get a treat. I don't care. I'm trying to catch my horse. I'm trying to keep it from getting killed. Whatever makes them happy to come. Whatever makes them happy. So this is, again, another little photo shoot, shoot with another girlfriend of mine. But the point being, be able to catch a horse, catch multiple horses. Uh, sometimes you've only got your halter and you just lead the, put the lead rope around the other horse's horse and start walking. They want to walk with the other horses and they'll walk along. So that's Torque and Onyx doing their thing uh, after she caught it. And this is my girlfriend and she rides with me all the time and I'm really training her too because most horse people never get a chance to lead two horses. In fact, Wendy, I was doing some training with some mounted police people one time and and I asked one of the guys, hey, can you, can you go out there and get those two horses for me out of that paddock and bring them up here? We're going to do whatever. He goes, I can't do that. And I said, what? He said, I've never been taught to lead two horses. And I said, wow. sweetie, is there ever any chance that you might be out there with your buddy on his horse and something goes wrong or he has to get off his horse for something, even if it's to pee and you need to hold his horse? 
we are going to work on that skill right now. So we, that's what we did. We said, we're going to learn how to lead two horses. And it's difficult. And I know a lot of people say it's dangerous. It is dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. But if you practice, you get better at doing it. And under duress, you want to be able to do that. You may not actually end up leading them, but you should be able to catch and hold two horses at an absolute minimum. And, and you know, and this, just to make a comment about this, point, we don't wear belts as often as we used to. And <laughs> belt, <laughs> uh-oh, I just lost her here. You are going to make me suck down this Pepsi down my nose. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Because the whole person point of wearing a belt is you have a catch rope. I mean, that's it, right? Yep. You know, and, and sports bras just don't work as well as those nope. other bras to be able to catch a horse. <laughs> But I mean, the other day, I don't remember what was happening. I was like, Brad, give me your belt. <laughs> so I had, they were like milling around somewhere and didn't want to, you know. That's exactly right. I actually have a belt on. I try to wear a belt as often as possible. Yeah. But anyway. Okay. So the next skill would be, and this should be horses that know each other, and you should teach the horse that you're ponying from to pony first. But every horse should know how to be caught, pony, and lead from another horse because under, especially under trail conditions, um, but if you're far away, you should be able to walk up, catch that rope on the horse that has the halter and lead rope that's loose and be able to keep walking. And the horse should know how to pony uh, down the dra driveway, down the road, those kind of things. This is again, me training my girlfriends so that they can do these things. Uh, Onyx is loose, she got back up onto torque and she is swooping to grab that rope and just keep walking. And as you swoop and keep walking, the horse goes, oh, okay, I guess we're going this way and follows along. And that is a good skill. Here is uh, another example of doing the same thing. This is a girlfriend of mine that was trying to learn to do this with her two horses. They know each other. They've been in a pasture together. Uh, this is near the end of the trail ride and we're going towards the water. And at this point they want some water. So we're just practicing at that time. And then after she's able to catch the horse and then she's working on ponying it. So those are some skills that anybody can practice. Uh, start with a horse that the horse knows. Start with a horse that's used to having ropes around him. Ponying can be a little dangerous if a horse gets, you know, Wendy, I don't know about you, but I really don't want a rope next to my butthole either. So some horses are goofy about having a rope next to their butthole. <laughs> if it gets underneath that tail, it can cause a um, exciting experience, let's just say, if the horse isn't used to it. So you need to practice a little bit. Practice with some really good old, uh, steady eddies, and then you can start practicing with your young horses. Um, cause to me, that's an essential skill. And I think that's one of those military skills, Wendy, that we've sort of gotten away from. Yeah. Um, you but know, you the practice. cowboys do it a lot, but we in the English world and the, and the trail riding world, we probably don't do it enough. Yeah. We just need to practice ponying from both sides of our horse because absolutely horses that will not let you pony on one side. You're right. Yep, and I'm going to add that to the presentation because I hadn't really thought about doing that, but yep. you're right. So one of the other things is when we don't have a halter and we, you know, uh, Wendy, I'm sure you've been in this situation. It's happened to me three times in my life. Driving down the road, oh my God, there's a horse on the side of the road. Now, if it's a cow, I'm going to call somebody, but if it's a horse, you know, I'm a horse person. I'm going to get in there and try it. But the best way to try to handle that is, you know, you don't normally have halters in your in your truck and trailer or in your truck or your car. And if you have a rope, you can catch anything. You can catch a goat with this. You can catch a cow with this, a calf, a foal. One rope does draft horse head, Arabian head. It doesn't matter. What you do is you make a loop uh, out of the end of the rope and then you fit that bite through that little loop and slip that over the nose. Now, this is a situation that you're gonna have to stand there and hold the the halter on the horse's face, okay? It can slip off if you're not managing it, but at least you've got something to be able to hold onto that horse. I probably would not be walking down the interstate with this on the horse. I would hold the horse, wait till we have some uh, real halter and a trailer and those kind of things, but this is called an emergency rope halter and it's an easy way to slip something onto a horse. You can do this with uh, a piece of hay string if it's long enough. Yeah. Um, but a nice piece of rope is, it, it fits any size head. I've used it for goats. I've used it for horses and it works beautifully. And if I, if I'm not mistaken, if you put a second loop over their nose, you have a, a more secure nose piece that will um, flip. Is the, that it? There's several different ways to do it. The reason I teach firefighters, this one 
is because if anything goes wrong and you lose the horse, it will slide off. Mm -hmm. And a lot of horses aren't trained to step on a rope, so I don't want them to break their neck. And this one, if it does, if you do doodle around and lose the horse, it'll slip off the nose, slip off the neck, and no harm, no foul. Somebody's got to catch the horse again. Got it. Okay. But um, that's that's two loops. One loop at the end of the rope, and then you put that loop through there and around the nose. Yep. And uh, I will send you an actual graphic that I've got of step by step that you can share with folks um, that makes it a little bit easier to understand. So. All I really wanna say is thanks to all my colleagues for all the photo shoots of all the loose horses and catching loose horses this last couple of weeks while you're preparing for this presentation. If you need to get a hold of me, that's how you get a hold of me. That's my cell phone and my email. Um, if you're really interested in large animal rescue stuff, we have a study group. It's a study group, not a prayer group. <laughs> Prayers are not usually taken. Uh, they're looked dimly upon. We try to do, do uh, a lot of study of the kinds of things that happen to horses. And uh, you're more than welcome to reach out and, and touch me if you have questions or whatever. Awesome. Well, once again, I really appreciate you having me, Wendy. Oh, it's great. It's a fabulous presentation. And, you know, it, it just, like I said, it has reminded me of, uh, I will tell you one story that when we were yeah. in Africa and we were at lunch and they were, uh, we were by this lovely little creek and these trees and everything was fabulous. And then this, pregnant elephant decided she wanted the water and she came into our camp and fortunately they were actually moving a couple horses and the horse I'd been riding kept Killian reared up and deflected the elephant which was ears flapped coming in um, and two horses broke loose that way and then another six broke loose that way and we My caught the two but the other six knew where camp was so they went to camp which was a yep. good one. that's right <laughs> Yeah, really good trail horses. You don't really have to worry about them. They're going to go to camp. And hopefully you train the people at camp that if the horses come in loose, you need to start looking for us because we're out here with the lions and elephants. <laughs> I think that's well, an this important Botswana point, actually. Or South if Africa. you do have a loose horse, you often have a rider on the ground. That's right. Um, so I am, I am willing to answer any questions. I know we've got quite a few folks on here. So if you guys have got questions, I, I'm more than willing to entertain them. Yep, you can just pop them in the chat of the Q&A. Uh, why don't you unshare your screen there? I think every oh, we've yeah. such a thorough job, we um, we haven't had any questions come in. Stop share. There we go. That's awesome. Yeah, that was that was quite an exciting thing. But fortunately, the horses knew where camp was, and it, in the end, it all worked. <laughs> I usually don't. So I was when I turned fifty. I was going to go to Botswana and do the riding in Botswana thing. Yeah. And then Mark walked into my life. And that year I was like, uh, and I was like, I don't really want to go to Botswana without him. So now I got to train him to ride so he can go to Botswana with me and ride with the elephants. But I don't oh, know actually, if I want to go now. Because we do a mobile tented camp and he can go in the vehicle and take pictures. Yeah, there you go. Well, he he's actually gotten to the point where he's good enough rider now. He could probably do it. So, yeah, I I, I think we're going to end up doing that now that uh, you know they're they're getting ready to open the border over Canada and everything. So, yeah, finally, great. Thank well, you guys for coming. Thanks, Rebecca. Really appreciate it. Of course, and thank, thank you for joining us tomorrow. We're going to talk about uh, Surefoot with foals because Bess Miller's coming back to give us an update yeah. later on how it's going with her foals. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll have a lot of Be Rebecca's friends coming up soon on webinars. So uh, just stay awesome. tuned. It's going to be fun. Thank you, Wendy. All right. Take care. Bye.